Hi everyone, I'm Lisa White, the Director of Education at the University of California Museum of Paleontology. And we have you here at the Museum of Paleontology because I wanted to better illustrate some of the fossil zones in the virtual experience called Explore Fossils. So what I'm going to do is just highlight uh, some of the namesake fossils from each of the zones. The Echigoing Formation is one of the units in the Kettleman Hills that's very rich in fossils. And one of the first zones that is introduced in the virtual field experience is called the Patinopectin Zone. And Patinopectin are a kind of scallop. So here's a shell, it's a, it's a bivalve. Uh, and it has a distinctive shell uh, with these ridges that is easy to recognize. Sometimes when we find the shells, they might be broken, uh, as you can see with these, but there's enough of the, the features that are distinguishable that we know when we're in this zone. And in general, uh, zones are named for characteristic fossils and they're named for a fossil that might be common um, just in that zone. But there are other kinds of fossils that you usually find associated uh, with, the, with the zone. And so some of these might include, this is a mussel shell. So Middleus is the name of the genus. It's a kind of California mussel from five million years ago. And sometimes we find them even larger in size. So at any one time in the geological past, you had mussels as large as this or as small as this size. So these are just some of the things that we find in the patinopectin zone. Uh, there are also barnacles. So they have really characteristic shells. Um, oftentimes they will cement onto other shells. In fact, we have an example here of uh, barnacles that have attached to a larger patinopectin shell. So that's an example of, of bioerosion or when shells encrust or attach or cement um, to another shell. So these are just some examples from one of the oldest of the fossil zones in the Echigoing Formation in the Kettleman Hills. And next we're going to look at another zone um, that's a little bit younger in time from the patinopectin zone. And the next zone is named for a clam called Macoma. So uh, with this particular fossil, uh, oftentimes the shells are uh, somewhat thin and they're um, broken up or fragmented a little bit. Uh, there are times when we find the fossil and we might just have a, a partial shell and we're able to see some of the interior of the fossil in a, in a cast, but we can still recognize this particular clam uh, named uh, Macoma is the genus name uh, because of its shape and uh, other characteristics. And so that's uh, very typical for uh, that uh, namesake fossil Macoma. We find other clams associated with the zone, and so this is one that's um, thicker in its shell dimensions, and it looks uh, quite a bit different from the uh, Macoma fossil, but when we find it, uh, we know that uh, it's associated uh, with the zone. Uh, there continue to be barnacles in this zone as well, and they, uh, occur in these kinds of clusters and so uh, we um, are always you know excited when we find these as well uh, so these are fossils that are characteristic of the Macoma zone. The next zone in the Echigoing formation that's highlighted in the virtual field experience is named after a gastropod called the uh, it's called Siphonalia and so that's the genus name for this particular uh, variety of snails. So gastropod is a snail. 
So it has a shell that uh, has whorls, so it's, it's a spiral. And this isn't the best preserved a siphonalia, and that's somewhat typical, um, is oftentimes when we find it, um, we may not have the whole shell preserved, but we know what it is from the overall characteristic shape. And in this case, um, we have a partial cast, but we can still see from the overall dimensions and characteristics of the shell that it's the, the same genus. So that's siphonalia, and sometimes we find you know, smaller ones in size, but again, from the characteristic uh, shape and aspects of this gastropod, uh, we know that it's siphonalia. Uh, there are other gastropods that you can find in this zone, and this one's a beauty. Uh, the name of this genus is Foreria, and it has these very interesting uh, spikes that are very characteristic of the uh, shell uh, as it has these uh, various whorls, so it also has a spiral dimension, but unlike uh, Siphonalia, uh, it has more ornamentation. So we're always excited when we find those associated with the zone. Um, other common fossils, uh, the mussel that we also find associated with other fossil zones in the Kettleman Hills, we also find in the Siphonalia zone. Uh, as we saw in other zones, uh, there can be barnacles that encrust or attach to uh, shells of other fossils. So in this case, in the Siphonalia zone, uh, we see examples of barnacles that have attached to this muscle shell um, from the genus uh, Middleus. Next in the etchy going formation is the pseudocardium zone. And uh, pseudocardium, which roughly translates in Latin to uh, sort of like a heart, um, if you look at it from a side view, uh, you can see that the nature of the, uh, the shape of the valves looks like, um, it looks sort of heart-shaped. And even though the shell can be somewhat eroded and fragmented, it's pretty well distinguished by the thick nature uh, of the shells. Uh, we have some more examples here where we might just have one valve, but you get a sense for how thick it is compared to other uh, bivalve or clam fossils. And in the interior of the shell, there are some distinctive impressions that are made uh, from the muscles that used to be present when the animal was alive. So those are muscle scars. And then you can see another look at this heart shape um, from the side view. So that's pseudocardium. And when we get to that zone in the etchy going formation in the Kettleman Hills, uh, we usually do find large numbers of those shells uh, in that zone. Um, there can be other fossils too. Uh, one of the common fossils in the etchy going formation, actually in all the zones, uh, are sand dollars. And so there are some examples here um, of sand dollars uh, that we find in this zone. Um, there can be other kinds of clams as well, you know, ones that might be larger in size and even more robust. Um, others might be smaller in size. Um, this is a particular genus that's characterized by a very um, equidimensional shell um, where it's kind of uh, the, just the same um, shape uh, and same height and same width. So we see quite a few of those. And in the interior of these shells, it has a very distinctive pattern along the hinge, uh, and so that helps us define uh, this particular clam, which is called glycimerus, and it also has distinctive muscle scars there. And our goal, again, in introducing you to the fossil zones of the Kettleman Hills is to show you not only the fossil for which the zone is named, but also in showing you here in our collections uh, some other kinds of fossils that are associated uh, with those horizons in the Kettleman Hills. In addition to the etchy going formation in the Kettleman Hills, 
There are also two other formations that we've studied in the area. And the next formation that we'll talk about that's younger than the Etchigoing formation is called the San Joaquin formation. And one of the zones that we distinguish in the San Joaquin formation is called the pectin zone. And, it's and pectins are a kind of bivalve or scallop that has a very distinctive shell with these uh, folds or ridges. Sometimes the shells are very curved like this one. Other times they may be more flat, but it's a very recognizable shell and they can be very, very common in this zone. And so we always know when we're in the pectin zone by the presence of uh, this genus of clam uh, called pectins. There are other kinds of fossils that are associated with the pectin zone. I find it one of the most fascinating zones in the Kettleman Hills. Uh, you even find corals. So this is a variety of uh, corals that lived uh, in the sea all those millions of years ago. And so we find uh, this particular uh, variety of organism uh, there as well. And so in addition to the corals and um, the, the pectin or scallop shells, uh, we often find uh, vertebrate remains as well. Uh, and so we're in the process of identifying these vertebrate bones and it's very exciting uh, when we find these as well. Um, there are also uh, other kinds of invertebrates. There are uh, oyster shells that have um, a distinctive characteristic as well. And so sometimes we find these associated uh, with the uh, scallops and the corals and with some of the uh, vertebrates that we find from this area. Above the pectin zone, but still in the San Joaquin Formation uh, is a zone named for a very small bivalve called Asila. Uh, and so the Asila zone is named for this tiny, it's only a few uh, uh, centimeters in, in width, uh, is a clam called Asila. And so uh, when we find it, it's often associated with uh, oysters, so this is a whole tray of oyster shells, and uh, oysters have kind of an irregular shape to the shell, um, and you can frequently see uh, lots of growth lines, but you know, kind of an irregularity to the shell shape, and so these are associated uh, with the acela zone. Uh, we also find uh, sand dollars as well, uh, they are uh, smaller in size than some of the other uh, sand dollars from uh, the etchy going formation, but uh, they're easily recognizable as well. The youngest formation that we've studied in the Kettleman Hills is called the Tulare Formation, and the zone that we've described is called the Amnicola Zone, and it's named for a very small uh, species of gastropod that you can barely see with the unaided eye. But when we find it in the amnicola zone, it's usually in these sandy units where it's just chocked full of the shell of that gastropod, of that snail, amnicola, and it'll have other things as well, uh, other fossils within the sand, um, including small bivalves, along with the gastropods. And sometimes we also find uh, larger bivalves, so not everything associated with that zone, the Anicola zone, is that small. But there is this particular uh, variety of bivalve that is also found associated with some of the units there. Um, and then others that are more robust. So it's a very interesting zone. Uh, that occurs uh, just at the, um, in the, the youngest um, part of this geological area. And um, in addition to those small 
snails and uh, these larger bivalves. You also find uh, horizons with rock exposed where there's no shells left um, in the, the rock at all, um, uh, no shelly material, but what we see are molds. So all these little circular U-shaped lines that you see uh, in this particular rock, which is a limestone, uh, reflect uh, remnants uh, of uh, shell fossils that were here um, at one time. So when we examine fossils associated uh, with a zone, uh, we're typically looking at a variety of fossils that are found together. So when this area existed millions of years ago and there was a living community of organisms, there would have been a variety of animals that were all living together. And so as they fossilized, sometimes we find the remains um, of these organisms uh, in the form of the, the whole shell, um, but other times when we find them, you know, it may just be molds and casts or impressions. So no matter the state of preservation of the fossil, it's still very valuable to a paleontologist who's examining fossils in these zones um, to be able to find such an array of fossils.